All right, guys, we're going to get started. So, in case you didn't notice, programming assignment two is now up on the Moodle. That includes the PDF that goes over all the directions you'll need to complete the assignment. There's a zip file here that you can download with all of the files that the assignment deals with. A link to submit it when you're done, and then a link to the GitHub repo. Uh, if you would prefer, instead of downloading the zip files, you can pull them on Git. If you're used to using Git, that's sometimes a handier way to do it. And then when I find my mistakes down the road, it'll make your life easier. But not a requirement, just if you want to play with it. So any 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 fixes will be on the Git, not necessarily another link. Well, I yeah, I will update this too with fixes, okay. right? But if I update this with fixes, you have to re-download it, sure. copy all the files. I mean, it's a pain, right? Okay. Git does it for you. But yeah, no, I'll push any changes. We'll get these will be up to date as soon as I find any changes. But this it's easy to tell something's changed. That not so much. Any other questions? If you've never used Git before, just download this unless you want to teach yourself version control system as part of doing this assignment. Not that that's a bad thing, but uh, it's certainly it's not required for any special imagination. Uh, if anyone's curious, this is the GitHub, what it looks like here when you go to the link. What you would essentially do is fork my fork my branch using this button up here, whether you don't have an account. Then you can pull it onto your machine and it would automatically track any changes. Git's great, but that's all I'm going to say about it. This is not a class in learning Git. There are good tutorials on GitHub, though, if it's something that you feel like you would like to learn. Uh, I'll try to do this with the other assignments too. So if anyone wants to come up to speed on Git, you can use it as an excuse to do so. If you have no interest in this, great, that's fine too. So what we're gonna go over today is some examples of using pthreads. So a lot of what we talked about last week was kind of the core part of this assignment without worrying about threads. So this week we're gonna talk just a little bit about threads and next week will be any questions, last minute questions you have. This assignment's due two weeks from last Monday meaning that you have essentially a two weeks minus two days now. It's not necessarily a short assignment, and it's certainly not as quick as your last one, um, at least not as quick human time-wise. It doesn't require four-hour compiles, but it is going to require a lot more of your time. So do get started. I would say the skilled programmer who knows what they're doing and has used pthreads before probably has five to ten hours of coding in front of them, depending on how quickly you can code. Uh, if you've never used pthreads before, you can probably double that pretty safely. So get started. Um, there's a learning curve. And for many of you, this may be the first time, yes, we give you that file. So that file we went over last week as part of that, yes, that's a solution that you could conceivably start from. But one is probably, the best way to start is probably not to try to change that file to a threaded version. Uh, you would probably have better luck using that file as an example and then writing a new program from scratch <coughs> to a threaded version. But that does mean for some of you, this might be the first time you've ever kind of written a program from scratch. It's not the find the comments and fill in your code in between. It's literally start with a blank file and create a program that works. So there is a make file included, but you're gonna have to modify it to add whatever files you add. It's kind of expect to build everything from the ground up within the context of what you've been given. So not nearly as much hand-holding as you guys had in 2400, and certainly not as much as the last assignment. Um, the write-up for this assignment, like we said, is that first link on the Moodle there. I tried to flush it out a lot more than last year's write-up was pretty under spec. If anything, this one's over spec, but at least that hopefully makes your life easier. That said, I did pretty much rewrite all of this from scratch. So if you think there's a mistake, there probably is a mistake. It hasn't been vetted yet, because I mean, I've proofread it, but you'll be the first class to actually vet my version of this write-up. So, Email me if you think there's a problem. Uh, also, the course list on Moodle is a good place to send questions either. I mean, if you can tell us it's an obvious typo, just email me. But if you just have a generalized question, head up the course list, because the instructors see that as well as all your classmates, which means you are going to get the optimal answer time. Because if one of us isn't around to answer it, maybe someone else is. Worst case, we answer it when we would have answered your email anyway. So use the course discussion list for generalized questions, uh, unless you have some reason why you don't think you want to do that. Also, in case no one noticed, there's a camera here again today. You're being recorded, or at least I'm being recorded, and it catches the audio for the rest of you. So we talked about this a little bit last week. This is essentially, this diagram represents the program you're trying to solve, where you're starting with a set of files that contain DNS names, and your end goal is another file that contains DNS names and IP addresses. 
Last week we wrote pretty much the single threaded version of this solution. That's included as lookup.c, I think, in the files that we provided. It's essentially the code from last week. I cleaned it up a little bit. Your goal is now to add essentially the threaded version or build the threaded version of this assignment. So you're going to need, like we talked about, the input thread pool, whose job it is to spawn one thread per input file, read through that file, and toss all of the domain names in that file into this queue. You then have a second thread pool whose job it is to spawn X number of threads. You guys can decide, it has to be at least two threads, but you guys can decide what you think the optimal number is. And grab DNS names out of this queue action from the lookup and then dump the DNS name and the associated IP address to that output file. There's this check for response arrow in this diagram here. This is no longer required. This is extra credit. Um, so, on that note, if you scroll through here, there's a bunch talking about you need to read this entire document before you get started. There is no single place in this document that tells you everything you need to do. Like any project you're probably going to deal with in the real world, the specs for your program are kind of interleaved throughout this. So you need to read the entire thing and maybe to start by sitting down and making a bulleted list of everything you have to do. Because um, it's kind of all interleaved in here. There is a section of specific specifications which is up here, but not all the specs are in there. Some of the specs are embedded kind of in that initial description, so on and so forth. So read this all. There are a number of extra credit. There's actually five different extra credit components of this assignment. Each one of these bullet points is worth five extra credit points. You can receive a score of no better than 110 on this assignment. So if you do all five of them, that's 25 extra credit points. But if you do all five of them and ace everything else, you're only going to get 10 extra credit points. You cannot exceed 110. Now, if you do all five of them and totally screw up your grading interview, then yeah, you can apply those points toward that. That said, if you do all five of these, you're probably not going to screw up your grading interview because it requires some know-how to be able to do this. Uh, essentially what they are is, like we talked about last week, most of these websites have multiple IP addresses. You can add support for that to your program. Um, you can add IPv6 support, which is actually not that hard to do. The hard part is you have to build prove it to me, meaning you're going to have to find some place that actually returns IPv6 DNS uh, lookups. Um, that's not, I mean, if you have access to that kind of a network, great. If you don't, that might be harder to do. But hey, I'd love to see an IPv6 version of the program. If someone can crank it out and has an environment where they can test it, go for it. This is that, uh, well, not there. So you could match the number of output threads to the number of cores. Uh, it may not be one per core, but you could intelligently take into account the number of cores you detect on the system and match the output threads to that. Like we said, your input threads are matched to the number of files that you provide, but your output threads are kind of wide open. You have to have at least two, but the more you have the up to some limit, the more quickly it's going to grab uh, responses. So one thing you can do is try to kind of intelligently match those output threads to the number of cores you have available, which is what most multi-threaded programs would be doing. Uh, you can close the loop on the lookup. So that's that arrow in the diagram that I said is now extra credit. That essentially means that your threads that read the input programs and toss domain names into that queue can't just exit when they're done. They then, for every name they toss into the queue, they have to be monitoring that output file and wait for that name to come back up in that output file, at which points they check it off as completed, and they don't actually exit until all of their names have been looked up. That's separate from the just basic non-extra credit configuration where those input threads can exit as soon as they're done parsing those input files. And the final piece of extra credit is you can do some benchmarking on this. So this would be benchmarking where you essentially compare how the speed at which your program one runs uh, changes as a function of the number of output threads you have. So this is kind of tied to that one where you match the number of cores, but if you want to spend some time trying to figure out what the optimal number of output threads is for a given system, and you can prove it to me with data to back it up, you can get some extra credit for that. So the extra credit is kind of the only thing that we didn't really touch on last week. You've kind of heard what the program is supposed to do in general. Like all of your other assignments, this will be 40% of your grade will be based upon completing a version of submitting a version of the program on time that meets all of the non-extra credit specifications in this file. The other 60% will be based on a grading interview where you have to sit down and both explain what you did to me. This is a more open-ended assignment than you've had in the past, so I'm going to be expecting you to tell me exactly how you approach this solution. There are multiple correct answers as well as I will have kind of some just generalized questions regarding some of the stuff you've had to deal with. It could be on p-threads, uh, it could be on mutexes, protection, stuff like that. 
it'll be anything that you conceivably would have to look up to uh, to complete this assignment is fair game for me to ask questions on. Are there questions on how it's going to be graded, extra credit, or kind of just on what you're trying to do for this assignment in general? Okay. Well, I'm not going to go over any more of this. Read it before you get started, or you will inevitably forget some small point that is way more painful to fix after the fact than it would have been to add in the beginning. Did you end up finding where you were leaking memory with your phone? Yes. Right yes, it's fixed. Uh, so what was happening is, was I, um, so I went through all of those, uh, remember it returns a linked list of all of those um, elements, and I was essentially only freeing the first item instead of the entire linked list. I think that's what it worked out to, but it's fixed now. Uh, we can, so, so that Valgrind output was in fact a bad Valgrind output. It'll tell you no leaks possible, and those, so remember the red flag in that case was the fact that the number of frees did not match the number of allocates. There are very rare situations where that's okay. Uh, in that case, it was in fact a mistake. It's been fixed. The version of the code that's online is correct and, and meets Valgrind. The version of the code that's online also differs from the one last week. It handles multiple input files. So if you give more than one input file, it processes them one at a time and essentially adds one more outer loop to the whole thing. Other than that, it's pretty much what we looked at last week. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm, just, um, uh, I'm not seeing any coverage of p here. Yep, they're probably not in your book. At all. Okay, uh, so we should just, yeah. Yeah, better. use, I mean, so, Right. Pthreads is an implementation library, right? Sure. The book's more theory. Yeah. Um, so if you look at the end of that document, there's a whole bunch of man pages you can look up. There's good Pthread references online, and today's recitation will essentially be Pthreads 101. Any other questions? All right. Well, let's get started then. So like we said, this is kind of going to be, I mean, essentially what we're going to do today is take you through Hello World and Pthreads. So it won't be directly related to what you need to do on this project, but it's kind of, it's kind of an overview of how pthreads work for those of you who haven't used them before. You will then need to integrate these concepts into your solution to this project. So to begin, and all of this code will get released after the fact, I will probably actually just add it to that zip file and to Git. Um, so if you're using Git, you'll have it automatically. If you're using that zip file, you might want to download another version tonight once I've uploaded this. I'll send out a message to the course list once it's been uh, added, but that's where you'll find this code eventually. But we have this hello.c program that builds this hello executable that we can then run that essentially just spawns a number of threads and then has each of those threads print hello world to the screen three times with some random time interval in between to kind of force the interleaving of some of this here. We can see the main program prints out when each of the five threads is created, there's zero through four, and then each thread prints its number from one, from zero through four, and prints which of its one to three printouts it's on. Um, so we'll go through all the code on this. This is kind of what the output looks like. There's actually a mistake in the program right now on purpose that we'll go over. I don't know if you can see it in this output, but what we can use this output to demonstrate is kind of the first rule of threaded programming, which is, you can't make any assumption about the order in which your threads run. If you find yourself in situations making those assumptions, it probably means you're approaching the problem in the wrong way. You don't have any control over the order in which your threads run. That's not strictly true. But for the purposes of this assignment, you don't have any control over the order in which your threads run. When you spawn a thread, it gets handed to your operating system scheduler just like anything else, which means it's up to the scheduler for the order in which it runs in. I mean, as you can see here, it runs thread run one before it runs thread zero. And it starts running thread one before the main thread is even done spawning. If we ran this program again, we'd get a completely different order of output. This time it spawns all the threads before it starts running thread three. And it doesn't even get down to the first th thread it spawned until down here after all the other threads are run once. So it's non-deterministic. It's not actually, but as far as you guys are concerned, it's non-deterministic the order in which these threads run in. In order to predict this order, you would have to know every other process running on the machine and the current state of the system scheduler. And then you could make the same decision that it would make, but that's not how you behave. You assume the system scheduler is a black box. It can schedule these in any order it wants to. It could run all of one to completion before it even touches the other ones. It's out of your control. Don't make any assumptions about the order in which your threads will run. Questions on that? 
There are ways to the kind of aside that you can file away in the backyard for future reference. There's actually three ways to run pthreads. You can run them and hand them off to the system scheduler, which is the default behavior, and that's what we're doing here. You can also run them kind of within a pthread scheduler itself that can either be a FIFO or a batch scheduler. So you can actually control the order in which they run to some extent, but you have to use kind of the built-in pthread scheduler, and your only choices are batch or, um, or first in, first out, I mean, which is essentially another form of batch processing. Um, those aren't used all that often. Most of the time you use the other pthread scheduler, which just means it uses the operating system scheduler. Normally the operating system scheduler is best able to schedule these in an efficient manner. That's its job. But that means that you can't make any assumptions about the order. Are we good on this? Okay, so let's take a look at the code. So I will open it up Emacs. And I'm just going to kind of give you guys a quick run through and then we'll come back and touch on some of these points in more detail. So the new include is this pthread.h file that essentially just gives us access to these pthread functions that we'll then be using. We see up here that we have this print hello function. This is essentially the function that each pthread's running. This is all of those print statements that you're seeing where it says, hello, I'm thread x. This is a statement x of x. Those all come out of this function here. We go past this function, we get down to our main statement. Where in our main statement we set up some local variables, we go through a for loop that essentially spawns all five of those threads. We then do a wait for all the threads to finish, and then we return like normally from this program. So that's kind of what's going on just in general. Um, we'll back up now and start to look at the, the individual items that are happening here. Have I lost anyone yet? Right. So let's start at main and kind of just walk through it. So we get into our main statement. It's our standard main prototype where we're taking in an argc and an argv. I don't actually use argc or argv anywhere in this program. It doesn't take any input on the command line. So I avoid them both right away. All this essentially does is this is a standard C convention for avoiding the unused variable warning when you have w extra turned on at GCC. So this is just telling the compiler that I am aware of the fact that I do not intend to use these variables so that it then does not give me the warning that I have variables that I'm not using, which is a valuable warning to have turned on because it'll actually catch mistakes that you may make often. In this case, this is just me basically controlling that warning. Um, then we create this array equal to, so num threads was the variable defined up at the top, it's defined to five right now. So we create this array of this p thread t struct type, where this p thread t, you can kind of think of it as like a thread handle, like we have file handles. This is a struct whose job it is to keep track of all the information for a given thread. When we spawn a new thread, we get handed one of these structs. When we then want to do something with that thread or when we want to make reference to that thread, we refer to it by one of these structs. So the struct essentially is a handle to a thread. It's the identification for that thread. We need five of them because we're spawning five different threads. So this obviously just an array, each one of these will then, or each element in this array corresponds to one thread that we have spawned. We then set up this long t as essentially just a counter for my for loop, and this int rc is just a return variable that we use for error checking. We then get down here to this first for loop that goes from zero to the number of threads. So this is our for loop that takes care of spawning our threads. We hit that printf statement that we saw on the screen, where this go ahead and prints out, I'm sorry guys, um, we go through and we essentially print out what thread we're on. We then call the first pthread specific function in this program, which is this pthread create function. pthread create, lo and behold, creates a new pthread. This is the function you call to create a pthread. We talked about it a little bit last week, but just to touch on again briefly, pthreads is the POSIX threading library. That's where the p comes from. Windows has an equivalent threading library. The pthread library is what you can use on Linux, BSD, pretty much any Dash and Nix system that kind of conforms to the POSIX standards. What a thread is compared to a process is a similar concept, but it, unlike a process that has its own protected memory space, a thread shares memory space with its parent program and with all of the threads. All threads are peers, also, unlike processes. When you create a new thread, there, there is no thread hierarchy. When you essentially, the main itself is one thread, and every thread we spawn will then be a peer thread. If threads spawn threads, those threads are peer to everyone else. So there's kind of just one flat level of thread hierarchy. 
It's not like processes where you have a parent-child relationship that kind of builds this tree hierarchy. So threads, unlike processes, share memory space, meaning they're much faster to spawn. Uh, they take up much less of a footprint, but it also means you have to be way more careful with how you use them. Another difference between threads and processes, when we spawn a new process, we use the fork command in Unix, which essentially starts two processes that just continue executing the code from the point of the fork. Threads are a little bit different. When you spawn a new thread, it doesn't keep executing this code at all. What you do is when you spawn a new thread, you pass it the name of some function that that thread then goes off and runs. This function is essentially like a main for that thread. It's the code entry point for that thread. So I'm going to spawn a thread. It's going to run or start running my print hello function. When that function is done, the thread will be done. If you wanted to run multiple functions, you would just make this a top level function. This function would then call other functions. But essentially, just like when you run a program, it runs the main statement. When you spawn a thread, it runs whatever function you specify right here. So backing up one sec, without, we'll get into all the arguments of pthread create in a sec, but pthread create creates this pthread. It passes back to us this an integer, which essentially is an error checking value. If you look at the man page, you'll see this, but pthread create returns a zero when it works successfully, and it returns something other than a zero when it fails. So we then go and do some error handling, like you should with any system call or with any library call that could return error information. We do this if statement. If it's zero, that means it'll skip the if statement. That's a successful completion. If it's any non-zero value, we're going to print out this error and we're going to crash. Essentially, we're going to exit with an error. So, questions on what this loop is doing before we get more into the details of pthread create? All right. So, looking at pthread create in a little bit more detail, it has a few things you may not have seen before, and that's a function pointer uh, for one, and then void star pointers within that function pointer for two. So. We're going to touch on both those things, but the first argument you pass it is essentially the thread handle. This is what we talked about up above. This is where you want to store information. I mean, like in C, where we're passing it a pointer, so it can actually give us data back, even though this looks like a function input, right? But as input, we give it a pointer to a location where it can store all the information about that thread, which is then how we refer to that thread from that point forward. What are we passing it? Well, we're passing it an element inside this array, and then the ampersand, meaning we're passing it the address of an element inside this array. It takes a pointer. The next thing you can pass it is a set of arguments, essentially, that govern how the pthread gets created. Uh, there are different ways to create a pthread. There are settings you can have it do. Null basically means just create a pthread in the default manner. You can look at the man page for all the different specializations about So if you wanted to specify what kind of schedule the pthread run, ran under, you would do it in a struct that you pass to this that then contains that information. Again, by passing it null, we kind of are using the defaults. If you were really concerned about writing portable code that could run on a variety of systems, you wouldn't do this because the defaults are different on different systems. So we can get away with this now. For the purpose of your assignment, you can probably get away with this. But if you really want to be anal about it, open up the man page. You can look up all of the particular options that you can pass it. And you can then specify them and pass it that, which means you're not relying on the system defaults to be what you think they are. Uh, but that's what that is. By passing it null, Word is asking for the defaults on Linux, which happen to work just fine for the purposes of this program. We then pass it a pointer to a function, which is maybe something you guys have never dealt with before. Um, this is kind of a very powerful concept in C. We didn't do a lot of this in 2400, but C functions are pointers just like anything else which means you can have functions that modify functions or functions that take other functions as arguments. This gets a little bit into what you kind of see in some object drawing to type worlds, more so when we get into void star pointers up above, but that's what we're doing here. We are passing print hello is that function we specified up above. In C, although you probably never thought about it this way, the name of a function is actually the name of a pointer to a function. So this request is an argument, a pointer to a function. We can look at what that looks like in a sec, and that's where we're passing it. We then pass it the arguments for this function. Because when you pass it a pointer to the function, you can, you're not actually calling the function. You have no opportunity to pass an argument to that function directly. So instead, you pass the arguments in as a separate variable, which then get passed to this function via the pthread create command. Um, have people touched function pointers in here before? Okay. Unless you've been, if you've done C programming, you touch this a lot. But if you haven't, you may never have seen this before. Um, Let's look at what the, so this is how we actually fill it in, but let's look at what the actual prototype looks like real quick. So I'm going to look up the man page for pthread create. 
And if we look in the man page, we see, so this is the actual prototype that we're looking at. We know it returns an int, that's that RC value that we checked for errors. We then know that we need to pass it, again, an address to one of these thread types, we talked about that. This is what the arguments would look like, again, we're just passing in a null pointer, but instead you could pass it a pointer to one of these structs that specify all the arguments. The interesting thing is this argument here. So this is what a function pointer looks like when you specify it. What we're essentially saying is a function pointer is a type. We're asking for a pointer to a function that returns a void star pointer and takes a single void star pointer as an argument. Uh, this name is actually not strictly necessary, it's just here to make it more readable. You could actually write this as void star, parenthesis star, parenthesis void star. So if you've never seen it before, it can be kind of disconcerting, but this is a function pointer. This is asking for you to give it a function that returns a void star and takes a single argument of a void star. If we had here void star space int, then it would be a function that returns a void star, takes a void star and an int. So, you will, if you encounter something like this in a man page, it's asking for you to pass the function. Then the last thing it asks for is actually the void star itself, which is what ends up getting passed into this function here when it actually makes that function call. Anyone totally lost? All right, this can be a hard concept to think about, but it'll make more sense when we look yeah, at I'm it. I'm totally lost, but I do have a question. What if we wanted to pass um, the function more than one uh, well, in this case, you can't. This function only takes functions. I mean, you have to match this prototype. So the only functions you can pass to it, you'll get a compiler warning if you pass to it anything other than a function that returns a void star and takes a single void star. Now, if you were writing, so we're just using someone's function that takes this function pointer. You could write your own function that takes a function pointer, in which case you could define it to take any kind of function you wanted. In this case, it's a moot point. The reason you're giving it a void star pointer is so you can essentially pass anything you want. You don't need multiple arguments. If you wanted to pass it more than one thing, what you would do is you would create a struct that contains all of those things, and you would pass the struct as this void star pointer. So this is kind of the generalized way to let you do whatever you want, um, if that makes sense. You would deal with this. So the place you see this a lot, which maybe you guys haven't yet, but if you write like mapping functions for data structures in C, you do this a lot, where you will write some mapping function that takes some function as an argument, and then its job is just to apply that function to every element inside the data structure. Um, so if you've ever done like a lot of hardcore, low-level peer C data structures, which people don't do quite as much anymore unless you're a systems person, because everyone uses C++ now, but in lieu of the standard template library, this is how you do these kind of things in C. Any other questions? Okay. So we'll go back up to the function, the print hello function here in a sec, but for now just realize we're calling that function that we specified up above, and as an argument, we are passing a pointer to this iterator, essentially, uh, is the only argument that we're passing it. It's a void star pointer. We could pass whatever a pointer to anything here. We're just choosing to pass a pointer to that iterator, uh, probably because that's somehow going to be something we want to use inside this print hello function. We then come down here, and the next pthread function we see is this pthread join, where essentially what a pthread join is, is it tells the thread that calls this to just wait. It doesn't, it's a blocking wait, so it doesn't continue past this function until whatever thread identified here exits. So by calling pthread join inside a loop, where we essentially pass it each pthread, we're going to guarantee that after this loop, all five of those threads we spawned have to be complete. So we're going to pass it thread one, it's going to wait for thread one to complete, then we're going to do the next iteration to pass it thread two, it's going to wait for thread two to complete, so on and so forth until we've done that for all five threads. So this is essentially, pthread join is a way of synchronizing threads. You wouldn't always use it in this manner where you're waiting on all threads, but this is a pretty common usage case where we just want to guarantee that we don't continue past this point until all five of our threads have finished doing what they need to do. Does that make sense? Again, you can look up the man page here, but when a thread exits, it can return something. This is where you would catch those return values if you didn't want to use them. We don't care about them, so we're just passing a null pointer there too. We then do this printout that says everything's complete at the end, and we return zero as the very last thing. So, something else I will mention, because there's an alternate way of doing this. Uh, so right now, the way the program works is we go through, we spawn all of our threads, we wait for each thread to complete its call to print hello, 
and then we return zero, which is like you do a normal name statement, it exits normally. If instead we, so this wait here is essentially only here because we want to make sure all of our threads finish before we exit main. If we pulled this out, So if we comment out that statement and just come down here to return, we'll actually see something very different. So just as a little aside, when I compile this for the first time, this is really important and is a mistake many of you are going to make. Whenever you compile a program with p threads, you have to add the dash p thread flag to the GCC compiler. This ensures that those p threads actually get compiled as a threaded library. Does anyone know what happens when you compile a pthread program but you don't get a pthread flag? It's compiler just like you Okay, it doesn't like, it's not clever enough to like run them linearly or something like that. That would be cool if you could use it as a switch. But uh, yeah, this is, this is required. Hopefully it gives you an error if you don't have this. That would probably be preferable to it, just blindly you doing your behavior. Now the issue is gonna be, guys, I gave you a nice make file for the, the files that you've already been given for this program. That make file, none of those files are threaded. So that make file doesn't have this pthread flag in it anywhere. So when you go to add your new threaded program to that make file, make sure you add that pthread flag in the appropriate place uh, or you're gonna get yourself in trouble. So you've been warned. Um, we're also giving it the dash warning all and the dash warning extras. This essentially just turns on all the warnings. Um, and we're giving it as, telling it we wanna output a hello file and giving it as input hello dots. So if we go ahead and run this, it compiles. And now let's actually run our hello program. And we see now that instead of actually running to completion like it did before, it exits prematurely. If your main statement, so your original entry point to your program returns, it doesn't actually wait for any of your pthreads to finish, it just forces them to terminate. So there's a couple of ways to get around this problem. The way we got around it before is, we wait right here for all the pthreads to finish before we go on. That means we can use a regular return, it's a moot point. The alternative solution is if instead of calling return, or before you call return, it'll never actually get to return if you do this. This is the last statement. You can use this pthread exit routine, where pthread exit essentially means pthread exit will exit main, but it implicitly adds a wait like this first. It doesn't exit the main statement until any threads spawned by main are done. So if we compile this now, And now if I run it, it's back to the original behavior, it finishes all together. So you generally need one of those two things. Either you need to manually wait for all your threads to finish before you let your main statement hit its exit, or you need to call this pthread exit function. You actually don't even need the return here if you do that. Pthread exit will also exit main when it's done. But if you call pthread exit, it implicitly waits for all of these. You need to do one of these things. It's kind of, I mean, it's overkill to do both, right? They're redundant. But um, the main reason this code's in here is if you were just wanted to do it here, you could just use pthread exit. But there are other cases where you're going to want to be able to do a join like this. So we kept the code in here uh, for the sake of demonstration mainly. Also, there's something to be said for there are times where you may find yourself writing programs that are designed to be compiled in threaded or non-threaded manners. The advantage to doing it this way is, so right now this will only ever work if it's a threaded program, right? This pthread exit is specific to a threaded program. But if I wanted to write this as a program that could be either, I could essentially keep this statement in here, protect it with like an if not defined that says if I want the unthreaded compile, it just ignores this, and then it'll work correctly normally too. So, there's reasons for maybe doing it either way, but realize that pthread exit, when called from main, will wait for all your threads to exit. If you don't wait for your threads to exit and main exits first, it kills any threads that are still running. People okay with that? Okay, so let's go back up. So I think I mentioned this. There's a mistake in this file. Anyone catches it before I get to it? Okay, yeah. I saw it in the first one, but there were a couple different toys. Right, if, it, well, if anyone... It's zero, actually. Right. It's not, yeah, if anyone, so each thread prints three times, but if they're numbering it. Yeah, right. the numbers it was the same yeah. exactly. Uh, right. If anyone catches what the mistake in the code is, yeah. yell at me. <laughs> Otherwise, I will, uh, I'll show you guys where the mistake is. 
But let's take a minute and look at this print hello function. So from looking at the man page, we know that the function that we, we can pass, we write whatever function we want, and we then pass it to the thread create. But there are some rules. We can only pass it a function of this prototype. So it's required to return a void star pointer, and it's required to take a void star pointer as an argument. So if you've never seen void star pointers before, kind of like function pointers, they are a concept you see a lot when you get into more advanced C programming. It's actually a very powerful concept. A void star pointers can be a pointer to anything. Um, it's a wide open pointer. What does that mean? Well, it means for a situation like this, where we want this to be user definable, you have to use void star pointers. By using void star pointers, this is kind of as close as you get to like an object-oriented type situation in PRC. This essentially allows us to overload this function. It allows us to write a function of this format where we can pass whatever we want here instead of having to always pass the same thing here. Now, some downsides to void star pointers, they're super dangerous. If you, it's not type checked ever is the problem. So we're, you, we're, we're gaining the power to kind of overload functions, but in doing so, we're sacrificing some of the type check safety of C. Um, you can never dereference a void star pointer. Doing so would be result, I mean, results in a compile error, but if you could actually pass the compile error, result in generally bogus output. Because when you dereference a pointer, the computer has to know how many pointers refers to a single byte addressable address in memory. Most variable types tape up multiple bytes in memory. So without knowing what type of data is stored at that pointer, the computer doesn't know how many bytes to read and return to you. So if you try to dereference a void star pointer, it's meaningless, uh, and like I said, the GCC won't let you do it. So the very first thing you have to do with a void star pointer is make it not a void star pointer. So there's a couple of ways of doing that. You could cast it. In general, casting is considered poor, poor programming style. You want to avoid casts wherever possible. So this is the preferred way to deal with void star pointers. The very first thing we do with this void star pointer is we set it equal to a pointer of the appropriate type. So we know what kind of type we're going to be passing to this. It's a void star pointer, so we could pass anything. But for the purpose of this program, we're saying that we're only ever going to pass longs, pointers to longs to this. So that's at least how we're going to interpret them. Again, though, this isn't type checked. So I could go and pass a double to this, but that means I'm going to interpret as long here. You're going to get all kinds of bogus output. It's on you to do the type checking with void star pointers. You just have to make sure that whatever we end up passing to this matches whatever you essentially do this implicit cast to inside here. Um, you no longer have the benefit of the compiler being able to do your type checking here. So we sacrifice that, <coughs> we gain the ability to kind of overload this generalized function. So questions on what you would do with a void star pointer? So if this were a struct, you would do the same thing. But the very first thing I would have like a struct, and then I would just set it equal to that. Like I said, this is preferable because it doesn't require an implicit cast. Uh, this does the casting for us, and it makes it clear exactly what's going on. Then we go through, and the very first thing I do is, this is just a pointer, and it's a pointer to that T, it's a pointer to our iterators where we end up passing it. That iterator changes. So the very first thing I do is I copy, make a copy of the iterator as it currently stands in my store. Because, again, I don't know what order these threads are going to run in, that T variable is constantly changing. If I try to continuously refer to it, I don't know what it's going to be output as. This is actually what this is. Then we get into our function, and our function essentially just runs, its body just consists of this for loop that runs three times in this case, where each rendition of the for loop, it prints out this statement, where part of that statement is the number that we pass it, and then the other part of the statement is just what number of printout from one to three it's on. Between each printout, we, this is a micro sleep, so it's just a command that sleeps for however many microseconds you specify here. We're saying this essentially means sleep for one second plus, for, plus or minus some random number from zero to one additional second. So this sleeps between one and two seconds each time, um, just to kind of force the interleaving of those things. It might actually be less than that. It might be between one tenth and two tenths of a second each time. I'd have to figure out exactly how many microseconds those zeros add up to, but that's what it's doing. And then at the end of this, we do a return null. One minor point here to that function we looked at, that pthread exit function that we saw at the end of main, you could also use that here. Uh, when you do a return, that essentially calls p When you do return from within the threaded function, it essentially calls the pthread exit function for you. So again, you could put pthread exit here instead of return. They're essentially equivalent in, in this situation on Linux. 
Uh, that's not true on it. But here it is. You can read the man page on Heathrow Exit and get all the nitty gritty on why you might prefer one form over the other. We're just returning null. We have to return some kind of void star pointer. We're not actually using our return value, but if we wanted to return an int or something, we could return a pointer to an int here. It would then be cast. I mean, if we can return anything, we would then just have to grab it as the appropriate data type where we caught this return value. Would you have to cast it there, or would you do the same implicit casting that you're doing before to return out? You can return anything. You don't have to do any casting at all. Okay. Yeah, it'll it'll accept anything for a void star pointer. Um, so you could just return a pointer to an int here. Now, something to think about is you have to return a pointer to something that's not in this function's namespace. Right. Because this that pointer would immediately become useless. So essentially, the way you would need to use this is, and it can be hard to actually come up with a. Cool. Someone should check me on that. Um, they'll they'll go out of scope with you. Yeah, it should go out of scope, but. So the only thing that would really make sense to me to pass here would be something that was referenced like at the input. So that, I mean that, that might be the only thing you'd ever pass back is you would have to get a reference to some memory space that was dedicated to you as your input, and then you could pass back a reference to something right. within that memory space. You pass the pointer to a struct, you could right. return a pointer to right. some member of that struct. That's right. Or if you pass a pointer, if you pass a pointer to an yeah. array, you could return one of the elements from that array. Sure. But it has to be stored in whatever called this thread, or it's never going to work. For your program, you may not have to do, I don't think you necessarily have to return anything, but again, and there's really two ways to return things, right? Because you could also just modify things directly, right, and then check them later. So it may, it's not uncommon just to see a return one. Are there other questions? I think I found a fix for the phone. Um, you could, you leave this, this? could you leave print hello alone and make a copy of T in that main for loop of main? The first so four loop of why would I might want to do that over what I'm doing now? Well, because the problem is that you're passing in an address to something that's changing your main function um, in that first for loop because it might t equals zero to num threads or one to four. Right. So if you copied it in every time through the for loop and passed that address to the copy, then you don't have to worry about it changing in some random time inside of print Good. Is that that's correct. I will I will restate it. Okay. Um, so essentially the issue is, I mean, do people have kind of questions on what's going on in this program before we get into the mistake and how we would fix it? All right, so the issue was, like we said before, this pointer to t that we're passing is changing every iteration of the for loop. Now, I know it's changing. That's why I'm being clever, making a copy of it right here. That said, this is still non-deterministic behavior because of where I make that copy. There's no guarantee, I'm assuming that my print hello function for each thread will run till at least that copy each time before this goes to the next iteration and changes that value of t. That's not a good assumption. That value of t, it could call p thread create and then stop on the first line of hello world and then do all the other p thread creates. Meaning that by the time I get to my copy in here, I'm actually copying t, t may have already changed. There is time between this this function being called and this copy happening <coughs> where anything else can happen. So this makes this a non-deterministic program, which you don't want, uh, and it's a mistake. So the way to fix it is making a copy is the right idea. The issue is where I make the copy. I have to make the copy before I call pthread create and then pass it a pointer to a specific copy that's dedicated to each specific thread, as opposed to trying to make the copy inside the thread. So the way I'm going to do that is we will add another array here. And when you're using pthreads, this is a pretty common construct. You tend to build these arrays that have one entry for each thread you plan on spawning, and you kind of dedicate that entry to that thread so you know exactly what memory space each thread's using. Could you, instead of sending a pointer to memory, just send the, um, the actual value? And it would think it's a pointer, but then you can use it. Yes, but it would be really happy. Because okay. the type checker will catch that. So. Right. I could take advantage of the fact that I'm passing along, and along also happens to be the same number of bytes as a pointer. Right. But it would be on a 64-bit machine. <laughs> but it would be happy. Um, right. It would require it would require implicit casts for one. And anytime you have to do implicit casts, it's generally a good hint you're doing. There's a better way of doing it, right? So right. yes, you could do it. No, don't do it. It's bad coding style. Right. Um, it's, it would be a hack. And the type checker would, you'd have to cast it because the type checker would say you're passing me along when I want a pointer. And even though they are the same thing, 
whatever that means, uh, I would recommend doing that. The correct way, the way I would do it is, let's, we, we're gonna make another array. Just like we have this array of threads where there's one dedicated, one entry dedicated to each thread, we're gonna make an array of copies of T dedicated to each thread. So we're just gonna call this copy T, and we are gonna make it num threads. Num threads long. Then down here, before I do the create each time, I'm gonna do my copy here. So I'm gonna say, Spacing. I'm going to say I want the value of copy of t that corresponds to the current iteration to be equal to the value of t itself. So in this case, it's not very exciting, right? We're storing an array where each element is equal to its index. Um, but when you, if you were trying to pass a big struct or something, this would become kind of more relevant. Then instead of passing a reference to t directly, I'm going to pass the address of one of these copies of t. That is then guaranteed, I mean, I'm not, so I could still change it, right? This is not, we're using threads here, it's a common memory space, so you gotta think like that, but as long as I agree to myself as the programmer that I'm not gonna touch copy of T after this point, then this will work just as we expected to work. Um, so I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna go up into this program here, and I'm gonna pull out my copy that's happening here, and I'm gonna modify this so that it just reads that pointer directly, which means I also need to so let's try compiling this. Because I can't move my variable names. Let's try that again. So now it compiles if I run it. Uh, and if I put if I put in my weight again. This is what happens when you change code on the fly. You have to change it back. So a minute ago, I forgot to have a wait for the thread, so I just exited right away. So I'm just adding back in well, some of the, the code that waits for all the threads before exits. One more compile, one more run. And now we don't get any of the numbering errors. It's working correctly. Are there questions on that fix? So this is kind of a pattern. You see this concept of maintaining these arrays that have one entry. So pretty much for any variable that you want to use inside one of these threads, you tend to build an entire array for it, where you have one element array for each thread. And that way you can kind of, again, it's a shared memory space. If you need separate memory objects for each of your threads, it's on you to create them and maintain them. And building these arrays where you have one entry for each thread, and then store the objects in those arrays, is kind of the standard way where it's kind of an easy, transparent way to keep track of you always know for any given array the index corresponding to the thread number is dedicated to that thread. And that helps avoid issues where you start clobbering other people's data from one array to the next. You could, there's no protection anymore, we're using threads, but it's kind of on you as the programmer to write code that follows some of these rules that are no longer strictly enforced by the OS or compiler. Questions on any of this? So I'll post this video online later. I'll also, if you have questions, hit up the discussion list. Get started on this assignment sooner rather than later. The one thing we didn't talk about today that you're also going to need to know is pthread and mutex, essentially. And that's how you actually protect those common infrastructure being the queue and the output files. So there's man pages on them. It talks about them a little bit at the end of that document we handed out. So this is pthread basics. If you tack onto this how to use mutexes and pthreads, you pretty much have everything you need to know. But we'll touch on it a bit next week. You're probably going to have to teach yourself before then because you're going to want to get started on this. Thanks a lot, guys.